decipher this uh, array of biological information, they will in fact get fundamental insights into how they might manage uh, uh, the information of the real world more effectively. There certainly is a crossover point between computer technology and biotechnology. Uh, we've, in the simplest form, seen the tremendous effects that computers and communications have had on healthcare. They've also had a tremendous effect on uh, research and the development of new medical procedures. Over time, we'll see better and better input devices where a human being can communicate with the computer and where the computer can feed back to our senses. There's a possibility that we can really see a direct connection between the brain and the computer. The interface between the information technologies and biotechnology, I think, has uh, many fascinating implications. One of the attractive opportunities is that by mutually working on these uh, informational problems, uh, each of us will be able to gain something new and beneficial from the other. Ever since I first came to Seattle, this house, Bill Gates' mansion to be, has been in a sort of perpetual state of becoming. Doesn't it look dreadful? According to the papers, when Bill Gates' guests arrive at this house, if it ever eventually gets completed, they're going to be issued with a door key on which is going to be encoded, because it's going to be one of those uh, sort of credit card slide-in door keys, electronically encoded with their favorite piece of music and their, the title of their favorite painting. You slide your key into the door, the door opens, and bang, from the Bill Gates masterpiece collection, there will be the laughing cavalier five times life, life size on some kind of computer screen and accompanied at full blast by the Hallelujah Chorus. I mean, can you imagine anything more awful? If that's your introduction to the room, can you think of what dinner is going to be like afterwards? In the next revolution, where communications become very, very inexpensive, and where you have, again, computers and a variety of what Bill calls information appliances, ranging from little wallet PCs to the replacement for your television set. It'll really be possible for everyone to have access to lots and lots of information and entertainment programming. And this access will translate itself uh, into really a very message on the internet. And if Seattle is the city of the future, I think it presages an erosion of social life and a rise in a kind of solitude for which I'm not sure that human beings are really equipped at all. I mean, I think the new city looks like a very lonely place for an awful lot of people. We know there is a very dark side to Seattle, and I find it reflected in the depth of that water that surrounds it. It's dark, deep, murky, plankton-rich water, and something of that quality is there in the city too. It's a city full of secrets, a place where dark things happen. It's a city which has this sort of bright, scrubbed, shining, earnest, optimistic face. And just under the surface of that, psychosis lurks. I once made a list of the number of serial killers just passing through Seattle, and I had 58.
on the list. We had Ted Bundy, who was the first really infamous serial killer. We have the yet unsolved Green River murders, where 48 young women disappeared from a busy highway near the airport, and their bones and remains were found scattered in the woods miles away. Both the Green River Killer and Ted Bundy took their victims from well-populated areas and left their bodies in hidden, lonely places, so deep in the woods that the sheriff's deputies had to hack their way in very carefully to get to the bodies. The rain and the mist and sometimes the fog, which we get in the fog, covers over things that people want hidden. Serial killers are addicted to murder as anyone would be addicted to drugs or to alcohol. And yet there's something inside them that, that makes them want to stop and they keep running away from it. And when you run fast enough and far enough, eventually you come to Land's End. In Seattle, we're here at the water. There's no place to run further. The Pacific Northwest has always been a place where individualism has been an important component of our life. We're sort of at land's end, and people who didn't fit in well in other parts of the U.S. tended to migrate here because it was a place that was developing later and they could be left alone. Uh, and eccentrics are prized here. I am a goddess of love and life. Mm -hmm. An alcoholic. I'm happy, spunky, and rambunctious. I am hungry. No, I am not a priest. I am young and confused. <laughs> Drifter. I'm a free spirit. I am kind, compassionate, and loving. Cut it. We both seem to arrive here searching. It could be fame, it could be a relationship, it could be just their running. And I think young people who come here aim high and they fall hard. But the thing is, in Seattle, the losers win. I mean, they <laughs> you could be in a band. Technically, that makes you sort of a loser in the eyes of society. And, you know, $5 million later, things are looking pretty great for the losers. And Seattle is, our losers are often on top. So many bands moved to Seattle trying to be big. And every band that's ever been big out of Seattle was big on accident and almost avoided being big as long as they could possibly could. Didn't have a mother, the only happiest. Didn't have a father. I think the grunge music is very hard and distortion and a lot of feedback and guitar sound, which is a lot like Seattle, like the skyline. It's very dark and foreboding. Seattle is like known for grunge rock music. Everybody knows that, but I don't think people really have a grip on the economic aspect of the music community. You know, in the last couple of years, Seattle bands have sold collectively around 160 million records worldwide. Music has an emotional impact on human beings, so anywhere where music thrives is, is a really positive thing for the city. It's really healthy. And you have a better society. He got guns. I think what you have happening in Seattle is you have people who have found their obvious location in the food chain who work at, say, Microsoft, and then there are the other people who are finding their role in the food chain through disaffection. And what they're really doing is not so much withdrawing from society as saying, no, society as it exists needs rethinking and reinvention. And again, 
so they're out there on the fringe, both geographically, uh, intellectually, you know, stylistically or whatever. They just, you know, they're reinventing just as much as Microsoft, but they're doing it from a different angle. I don't think I know of anyone in Seattle who has opted out of the future. Um, everyone in their own way has opted in, just in various forms. Some people are doing the high-tech route, some people are doing the fashion slash lifestyle route or whatever, but everyone's still doing the future there. Nobody's not doing it. I'm a driver, I'm a winner. Things are gonna change, I can feel it. I am not a loser. Am I a loser? No. I don't buy into that Seattle thing. <laughs> a loser? No. I am not a loser. Am I a loser? Oh yeah. Anybody that hangs out in Seattle is a loser. Oh, am I a loser? No. I'm not. Uh, no. I don't think I'm a loser. No. He's definitely not a loser. I hope not. No, he's not a loser. And if it has 258 connections made of concrete and steel, um, it's got a million more failed connections between people, groups of people. Um, and I like the way in which Seattle's topography exactly reflects its sense of its own disconnectedness, its need for bridges. And it's a powerful one. There are a number of contradictions, I think, that go throughout the city uh, between the appearances uh, that are put on for the, the country as well as the people who live here uh, and the, the underside, the underbelly of Seattle. Uh, you see it most, perhaps, on the streets. About 5,000 people every night have no place to stay. Seattle has a wonderful reputation nationally as one of the most livable cities in America. And yet the National uh, Homeless Law Project has voted Seattle one of the five meanest cities in the country in terms of how it treats the homeless. They've passed an ordinance, for example, that makes it illegal for homeless people to sit down on the sidewalks during business hours. It's hard to be homeless. It's so hard to be home. If you don't understand, just being homeless is a shame. It just, it's a crying shame. Stand on again. One of the inherent conflicts in this notion that everybody has the rights to be an individual is that when we concentrate uh, large numbers of population, those rights end up being in conflict. Uh, one of the things that has happened in our downtown, for instance, is that because our climate is temperate and it's a good place to come if you are homeless or having difficulty, uh, that ends up being in conflict with the needs of the people in the downtown to preserve the quality of life. Well, our downtown has had some cycles that we've worried about. Well, we saw a civility threatened on our streets, and we stepped up to it. We passed some uh, anti-aggressive panhandling laws, no sitting and begging laws, uh, laws that some people would say are a little too strong, but what we all believe in this city is that the pedestrian has the right to walk the streets and feel secure. I definitely believe that, that no matter how progressive you are as a city, you cannot be uh, so tolerant that civil disorder and uh, civil disobedience be about is that the myth of Seattle uh, is attracting so many folks uh, and that we may end up being victimized by our own myth about uh, the quality of life and, and how nobody struggles you know everybody's a Microsoft millionaire here and and those sorts of things uh, I think it is possible for us to preserve this place and grow, but not the way.